In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As our country celebrates its independence anniversary this weekend, it is my great joy and privilege to welcome to our pulpit this morning our guest preacher, Mr. Robert Wallace. As we start the 240th year of our independence and freedom, I'm honored to speak to you today about this great country, about some of the men and women who helped make it great, about some of your freedoms and liberties, and about your God. I begin with the story of a Jewish man who lived in Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s. He survived the concentration camp and the death camp. He survived because of his, he believed because of his faith in God. And the fact that he would recite every day from memory the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. After the war, he and a young but famous Shakespearean actor became good friends, and they would visit from time to time. As the years went by, one day when the actor was visiting his old friend, he asked him to come to the synagogue that night where they were having a program and recite the 23rd Psalm. The actor, of course, knew the importance of the psalm in the old man's life and readily agreed to do so, but on a special condition that when he finished, the old man would also recite the psalm. The actor's recitation was a performance, a magnificent performance. His enunciation, pronunciation, diction, rhythm, rhyme, everything was just perfect. When he finished, the audience applauded. They cheered. He then called on his old friend, who began with a weak voice, a voice that broke again and again with emotion as he relived those terrible days. When he finally finished, there was no applause. There were no cheers. There was stunned silence. But in every eye and on every cheek, there were tears. Finally, the actor said to the audience, You see, my friends, the difference? I know the song, but he, he knows the shepherd. We in America, with our capitalistic system, place a value on nearly everything. But I wonder how many of you have ever considered the value of your freedoms and liberties? Or in a larger sense, what is it worth to be an American and be free? I'm going to discuss that question with you here today and to help us with the answer. Allow me to take you on a short trip through the pages of history. We begin our journey in the colony of Virginia in the town of Richmond. It's March 1775. We are at the convention hall. Inside, a man is making a speech. Outside, the British troops have assembled. The war for American freedom will soon begin. We listen as the speaker concludes that speech with these words. Is life so dear, or peace so sweet, as to be purchased with chains and slavery? I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty, or give me death. Patrick Henry. 
We travel now to the colony of Philadelphia, excuse me, the colony of Pennsylvania, the town of Philadelphia, where the Second Continental Congress is in session. They've just passed a resolution unanimously. We read these words from that resolution. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. Among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The resolution is the Declaration of Independence. It's July the 4th. 1776. We travel now to the state of New York, the city of New York. It's September 1776, and the war for America's freedom has already begun. A young captain in, the, in America's army has been captured by the British. He's been tried and convicted, not as a captain, but as a rebel and a traitor. The British troops have assembled a gallows in the town park. They've ordered all the townspeople to assemble to witness the penalty to be administered. They expect this young man to beg and plead for his life, and they want to teach these upstart Americans a lesson. We watch as they place the noose around his neck. The following is a report from an eyewitness to the events of that day. He asked the prisoners, did he have any last words to say? He nodded his head, and the blindfold slipped down around his neck. His voice was calm and steady. My name is Captain Nathan Hale. I am not a rebel. I am not a traitor. I am an American. I've done what my commanding officer has ordered me to do, as all good soldiers are required to do. And I have no regrets for what I've done, even now. My only regret is I have but one life to lose for my country. If I had 10,000 more, I would give them all. He just turned. 21 years old, and it hanged him. We travel now to the northern part of Mexico, where people are fighting for their freedom. It's March 1836. Santa Ana's amassed an army of 5,000 trained fighting men armed with rifles and muskets and cannons. They've crossed the Rio Grande, where a group of 189 have been ordered to hold a little-known crossroads. They choose for their defense a Spanish mission, a house of God, if you will. We listen as their commanding officer directs them. We will never Surrender, we will never retreat. And they hold, against 5,000 men they hold, for 13 days they hold. That all but seven of the 189 are dead. Santa Ana is so outraged by the delay caused by the 189, and the fact that they've killed over 700 of his men, that he orders the seven prisoners of war to be executed. He then orders that all but one of the 189 bodies be burned so that their families will be denied a proper burial. Forty-six days later, the army of Santa Ana meets the army of Sam Houston on the battlefield, and a cry goes up. Remember the Alamo. In less than 18 minutes, the army of Santa Ana is annihilated. 
Texas wanted freedom from Mexico and in time became the 28th state in this great union. We traveled now to Washington, D.C. in September 1862, and we were in the second year of the bloodiest war in our entire history. We watched as President Abraham Lincoln signs a document entitled the Emancipation Proclamation, by which he orders that on January the 1st, 1863, all slaves in the rebelling southern states will then be free. We travel now to a beautiful island in the Pacific. It's a Sunday morning. We watch the sun rise slowly over the mountains. And suddenly out of the sun comes wave after wave of Japanese bombers and airplanes. It's December 7, 1941. The day of infamy has begun. On that day alone, 21 American warships will sink beneath the sea. On that day alone, 2,338 American personnel will die. But a cry goes out again, remember Pearl Harbor. And all over this country, young men flock to the recruiting offices to volunteer to fight for their country. In Europe and Asia, we take back from Hitler and Mussolini every country they have conquered. In the Pacific, we take back from the Japanese every island they have conquered. And we bring freedom to hundreds of millions of people. And in time, Hawaii becomes the 50th state in this great union. As the American troops and our allies drove across Europe and brought freedom to the inmates of the concentration camps, we found these words carved in a wall in one of the buildings. I believe in the sun, even when it does not shine. I believe in love, even though I received none. I believe in God, even when he does not speak. Americans have answered the cry for freedom again and again and again. World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Granada, Desert Storm, Iraq, Afghanistan. In our very short history, more than 1,500,000 men and women have died so that you and you and you and I can be free. We return now to Washington, D.C. It's January 1961. We've inaugurated a new president. And I believe he said it better than anyone else. Let every country know whether they wish us ill or wish us well. That we will pay any price, bear any burden, endure any hardship, support any friend, and oppose any foe to ensure the survival and success of liberty. In November 1963, in Dallas, Texas, they shot and killed President John F. Kennedy. We travel over to the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. It's August 1963, and it's hot, but hundreds of thousands of people have gathered to hear a man make a speech. We white Southerners tend to forget that the speaker during his lifetime never asked for special privileges. He only asked for freedom. We listen as he concludes that famous speech with these words. When you let freedom ring, 
from every hamlet and every village and every city and every state. You will speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will all join hands and sing in the words of the Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. We travel now to, uh, before we get there, in April 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee, they shot and killed the Reverend Martin Luther King. We travel now to our last destination. We were in the field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. We look up and see a plane flying low in the sky. On that plane are some very important people, Americans. One of them is 32 years old. He's married. He has three children. His wife is pregnant. And it's September the 11th. We listen to the word, last words that children will ever hear. Okay, let's roll. Todd Beamer. What is freedom worth to a young man standing on a gallows with a rope around his neck? To 189 men and boys being pounded to death by cannons? To the millions of American Indians forced to leave their ancestral lands and to walk the Trail of Tears, to a white woman named Susan B. Anthony, who in 1883 and again in 1884 went to jail so that American women might someday have the freedom to vote. What is freedom worth to the millions of black men, women, and children who wore the chains of slavery for more than 250 years? What is freedom worth to a group of American sailors standing on the deck of the ship and, who, and shooting hopelessly and frantically at Japanese targets? while they and their ship sink slowly beneath the sea? What is freedom worth to four little black girls killed by a Ku Klux Klan bomb in Birmingham, Alabama, while they're attending Sunday school? What is freedom worth to the hundreds and thousands of men, women, and children trapped in crashing planes and burning buildings on September the 11th. And what is freedom worth to nine adults studying a Bible study in their own church in the heart of Charleston and minding their own business within a mile of where you sit right now? And they're executed because their skin is black. And finally, what is freedom worth to a young immigrant sailing into New York Harbor for the first time and seeing the smoking, twisted ruins of the World Trade Centers, but then turning and seeing, still standing, that symbol of America known everywhere in the world, a lonely statue with a poem inscribed on its base. The poem reads in part, Keep ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she, with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddle masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shows. Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed, to me. I left my torch beside the golden door. A statue named 
liberty. What is freedom really worth to Americans? Let me tell you. Freedom is worth everything. 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 In honor of and appreciation for every man and woman who has ever worn the uniform, I close now with these words from a song by Billy Ray Cyrus. It's a song about a soldier named Sandy Kane. He and his companions left America to fight in a war. They left as boys. They came home as men. Some in a box. The last stanza of that song goes like this. All gave some, some gave all. All stood through for the red, white, and blue, and some had to fall. If you ever think of me at all, remember all your liberties. And then recall, all gave some, but some, some gave all. Then the father decided.